Welcome to your second video lecture. Today we'll be beginning to look at our inquiry question, how and why do worldviews change, by exploring the worldview of medieval Europe. Remember, you'll be required to answer a couple questions in our Google Classroom following the video, so pay close attention, take notes if you need to, and pause the video as necessary. The Middle Ages, or medieval times, are a period of European history that occurred between the fall of the Roman Empire until the Renaissance. This includes the time period from about 5th century or year 400 to the 15th century or year 1400. In the Middle Ages, European society was organized in a hierarchical system. Hierarchies are a way to organize people where they are ranked above one another according to their importance. Hierarchies are easy to visualize as a pyramid, with one person at the top and more and more on each level until the most people on the bottom. One example of a hierarchy would be the adults in a school. There is one principal, two or three vice principals, and lots of teachers on the bottom. The hierarchy used during the Middle Ages is called feudalism. In feudalism, people were expected to stay in the level they were born into, and each level of the pyramid offered service to the group above them in exchange for land, the primary form of economy at this time. At the top of this feudal hierarchy was the monarch, a king or a queen. They owned all the land in the country. They could give land, sometimes called a fief, to the people below them. The nobles, the second group down in the pyramid, and the second most wealthy, would supply the king or queen with horses and soldiers for their armies in exchange for land. Knights would swear their loyalty to the nobles in exchange for their land as well. Knights were professional soldiers. They swore loyalty or allegiance to the king and the nobles and would fight for them in exchange for pieces of land called manors. They would also protect the peasants in order to have this land worked for them. Last on the pyramid were peasants. Their job was to work the land of the knights and nobles in order to gain their protection, food, and shelter. Peasants were illiterate and uneducated. Some were known as freemen who rented land from the lord and worked for pay, and others were serfs and could not leave their lord's land without permission. However, interestingly, serfs could run away to a town and gain their freedom if they remained undiscovered for a year and a day. The medieval way of life known as feudalism was based on the ownership of land, and feudal social classes reflected how much land people owned. Royalty, like kings and queens, were in the highest class. After them came the noble lords such as dukes and earls. They were followed by the knights, who were followed by skilled craftsmen, who were followed by the lowly serfs who worked the land. Under the feudal system, people of lower classes showed their respect to the upper classes by serving them and for their service they received rewards. For example, the lord of a great castle might serve his king by supplying him with knights and soldiers for a war. To show his appreciation for this service, the king might reward the lord with a gift of land, usually in the form of a manor, which was an important unit of territory in feudal society. A manor usually came complete with a large house like this one, several farms, and at least one village along with all the serfs who lived in it. The crops grown on these lands supplied the lord with his income, and the more manors he had, the richer he became. Another hierarchy that existed during the Middle Ages was that of the Catholic Church. The leader of the Catholic Church was the Pope followed by the archbishop, the bishops, priests, and lastly the parishioners, or the people that went to church. The give and take between the levels of the church hierarchy was similar to that of the feudal hierarchy, as it dealt with land. In fact, the church became a large landowner and was very wealthy at this time. In addition, parishioners would pay tithe, or part of their money from working their own land, to their priest. The most religious of society would become monks or nuns. Monks and nuns were the most educated people in medieval society. In medieval times, nearly everyone in Western Europe belonged to the Roman Catholic faith. 
And although not every person was a sincere believer, this was a time when most people held deep religious beliefs. In fact, about one out of ten medieval people became monks or nuns devoting their entire adult lives to the service of God, locked away behind the walls of monasteries. Eight hundred years ago, lords and ladies supported the church with income from manor lands and often paid the wages of priests as well. Noble families helped to maintain parish churches in the villages on their estates, in part because they believed that such acts of generosity would help them reach heaven. Many of the people in medieval Europe lived in the countryside. However, the fighting of a war called the Hundred Years' War between England and France devastated the countryside. Peasants from both nations revolted because of high rent and taxes they had to pay for the war. People began moving into towns. The rise in towns and trading led to the development of mechanical clocks, fine clothing, and jewelry. The desire for these and other luxury goods led to the trade outside of Europe and the introduction of sumptuary laws. These regulated who could purchase what in order to maintain the social hierarchy. It also led to a major growth of guilds, which were associations of merchants and artisans based on their craft, such as the blacksmith guild you see in this picture. They would train new artisans to the trade and control the craft in a town. Even when serfs ran to the town from the countryside, they could join a guild to learn a new trade. Today we are going to be talking about medieval guilds. Um, we know that early on in the medieval times that, that everything was based around those feudal manners, right, and manorialism. Well, what we're going to see happen, though, as we move forward, once we get to the Crusades, we know that things are going to change. We're going to move away from manorialism. Manorialism is that idea of self-sufficient manners, right? Well, now we're moving into a period of trade. We, we see that trade rekindled. And, and so what we start to see happening are goods flowing into Europe now for the first time. Um, they're coming in to Europe uh, from the Middle East after the Crusades. Um, they're heading up from the Vikings. Uh, they're moving into trade areas like Flanders, the Hanseatic League. And, and so for the first time in a long time, we actually see trade goods that are available throughout Europe. Well, as these trade goods start to come in, um, as these goods start to be available, as people start to flock to towns as a result of this uh, influence of trades, what we start to see develop are these guilds, these associations and groups of artisans and craftsmen who are going to group themselves together, um, join together for their economic benefit. So this might be a, a group of weavers, a group of blacksmiths, a group of shoemakers, something like that. What they're going to try to do is control all of the trade in a given town. Um, so like, for example, all of the bakers in a certain town uh, might all be members of the Baker's Guild. Um, and the idea is that allows them uh, to set the certain rules like uh, for things like wages, hours, and working conditions. They can be in control of that. The other thing that allows them to do um, is to make sure that nobody else is going to be able to come in and, and do that job uh, unless they speak with the guild, unless they pay them some sort of fee uh, in order to come in and participate in, in the economic system in that particular area. The other thing, though, that guilds do is they're going to offer a support group for these merchants. Um, now that people have moved outside of the manors, that they're not just relying on the feudal lords, they're going to have to rely on each other for things um, like assistance. Uh, it might be something like loans. Uh, it, and an example might be that if a guild member dies, the guild would step in and they would take care of the widow or take care of the children um, in that particular instance. The other thing that guilds are going to do, though, is they're going to take control of training future guild members. And so what's going to happen is, um, this is going to start at the very beginning, at a very young age, when a parent um, would bring their child into a, a member of that guild, um, a, and they want that child to learn that new, that new trade. Millions of Europeans died of the bubonic plague or Black Death between 1346 and 1350. This caused labor shortages and bankruptcy in the feudal estates that remained, and even more people moved into towns. The Black Death also made some people question their faith. Why would God do this to them if he was real? People also became critical of their church as a wealthy institution and were tired of paying money to it from their land.
the delirious victim staggers about in his final moments. His speech is slurred, skin purple-black covered with swollen, pus-filled lumps as death calls him. Witnesses to this terrifying spectacle called it the Dance Macabre, or Dance of Death. In the 14th century, a terrible catastrophe fell upon Asia, Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa that would change the course of history. The Black Death. The Black Death, or bubonic plague, was an outbreak of disease that killed one-third of the European population in the period 1347 to 1350. It had a similarly devastating impact in Asia, the Middle East, and North Africa. The disease played no favorites. Rich and poor, young and old, priest and peasant, all fell victim to this horrible and, at the time, unexplained sickness, which was spreading like wildfire. The populations of entire towns and villages were wiped out in a matter of days. The dead were buried in mass graves to cope with the rapid death toll. Only a thin covering of soil was placed over the dead bodies before another layer was buried on top. Pope Clement VI consecrated, made sacred, the Rhone River so corpses could be thrown straight into it. So what is the Black Death? Where did it come from? While it's difficult to trace with any real certainty, the outbreak is believed to have originated in the Gobi Desert in Mongolia early in the 14th century. Prior to this, the disease had existed for centuries in regions of Asia, with small outbreaks occurring from time to time. Any one of these could have been the source. Once infected, the victim would first experience a high fever, aching limbs, and fatigue. Within days, the lymph nodes in the neck, armpits, and groin would start to swell and turn black. These black swellings are where the Black Death gets its name. Michael Placentius, first-hand witness to the horrors of the Black Death, wrote, Here, not only the burn blisters appear, but there have developed gland boils on the groin, the thighs, the arms, or on the neck. At first, these were the size of a hazelnut and developed accompanied by violent shivering fits, which soon rendered those attacks so weak that they could not stand up, but were forced to lie in their beds consumed by violent fever. Soon the boils grew to be the size of a walnut, then to that of a hen's egg or a goose's egg, and they were exceedingly painful and irritated the body, causing the sufferer to vomit blood. The sickness lasted three days, and on the fourth, the latest, the patient succumbed. Society was clearly changing. Towns created societies where feudalism didn't work, and wealth became even more important, and people questioned the role of religion in their lives. A period of great creativity in art and science and religion was about to begin. This rebirth is what we call the Renaissance. Please answer the following questions in Google Classroom. Feudalism lasted hundreds of years. However, it eventually began to break down. So whose interests were best served by the system? So we're going to answer that question using examples from the feudal hierarchy. And what do you think created the breakdown of the system? And then finally, how could the following children's rhyme actually be about the Black Plague as some historians believe? Ring around the roses, pocket full of posies, achoo, achoo, we all fall down. <laughs>